So our next speaker is Anna Belikova, and again the title is right there. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like first of all to thank the whole organizer uh, for inviting me. So I think it's a great place and I enjoy it a lot to be here. So uh, the title is the categorification of the Casimir operator of the quantum SO2. Uh, and uh, as you see from my quote here, I will really try to involve you in this project, really to show you how the story was the starting point and what was the motivation for the whole story and uh, how it finished. So the formal um, plan of the talk is again the introduction to this quantum uh, loaded two category introducing the Casimir complex and shows the all nice properties of this complex we, we were able to, to prove. Okay, so uh, um, I will start with the motivation. And uh, so my motivation was a little bit different from the errant one. So uh, I was interested in so-called universal SO2 invariant. So the universal SO2 invariant is what you normally call Richtigen derived invariant. It's the same as taking a special um, just uh, to evaluate this invariant at some uh, at some spe specified representation. So if you evaluate, a, so if you just put a color on any line of your tangle which represents the representation, then it's the same as taking a uh, trace of, of of this universal invariant corresponding or a map uh, on just on this representation, not on the algebra itself. Yeah, and so what I'm talking about is universal invariant. It's where you you can think about it just to putting an element uh, of uh, SL2 on the, so for instance, for the crossing, you just put an R matrix, and for the cap and cup, you, you, you put some maps on the Lie algebra, and the result will be just an element of the algebra, and more precisely, this element will be in the center of this algebra. So that just the universal uh, Jones polynomial, just element of the center, so C4, we were, we were interested to understand what is the center. Uh, so what is the categorification of the center of this, uh, of this algebra? And uh, more precisely, I would uh, here, so I stated this result of Habiro, saying that you can uh, decompose uh, this universal invariant of a tangle in this way, where with, this is just the coefficients, so the polynomial, Laurent polynomial on Q, and these guys uh, uh, here, they are given by this formula, where C is just a Casimir. So what you see, you need only uh, even powers of the Casimir, and here, um, it's in fact, it's the, uh, it's the eigenvalue of the cos square, uh, eigenvalue of the square of the Casimir acting on the wave space uh, one one i. So uh, this is an expression for the for the just for the Jones polynomial of one one tangle. So you can also generalize this uh, for the n, n n by n tangle. The only difference it will be that you will we will end in the nth tensor power of this UQSL2. And for the moment, so what was Aaron taking was uh, telling you that we are only able to categorify the algebra structure of UQSL2, not the whole algebra structure. So therefore, I restricted in this example just for the case of one one tangles. And uh, moreover, so this, uh, this uh, impression is very interesting if you look at the perspective of categorifying three manifold invariants. So, for example, if you don't like, so I, for example, don't like to, to walk at Trotz of Unity, then in order to get from this expression for the Jones polynomial, the expression for the so-called unified uh, SL2 invariant of a manifold obtained by plus or minus one surgery on the closure of this one tangle, what you have to do, you just take exactly this expression and you replace this uh, sigma P just by the by this expression, you, you take this q to the power p plus one, and here plus one. So this means one minus q p plus one, one minus q p plus two, and you go until one minus q two, two p plus one. So if you just replace sigma p by this expression, you have a unified invariant of a of the three manifold obtained by plus or minus one surgery on on this tangle. And we also have an impression what happens if you do say B surgery on, on this. So in general so so what I just wanted to say it would be 
interesting to understand how, how this basis for the center categorifies. And clearly, uh, so what we start, we just start with the simple element in the center, just Casimir itself. Okay, so, so, so much for the motivation. And then, uh, again, so this is a definition of the... Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so you have to say in which exactly completion. So it's, uh, it's an element that have you ring. Yeah, so and it converges in this sense that uh, you look at uh, 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 so more divisibility by cyclotomic polynomial means that you are your father in the completion. So that's uh, the story. Okay, so uh, this is a quantum group. Again, I just consider this as an algebra, not as a Hopf algebra. So therefore, I I will just uh, so look at this structure. Um, again, uh, I will use uh, this balance on loose of perfect replacement for the for the quantum group, which uh, just uh, uses uh, collection of orthogonal eigenpotents, which you have to think about just as a projection at the n's wedge space in some anticipation. Yeah, and then uh, if you project in this specific n space, then k is just acting by uh, power of q. E just uh, switch n to n plus, so increases the index, and f decreases this index by two. So just exactly what happens on the representation. And um, this is how the computer. So, so it's the only cell relation we have as so as you two cases, just this one, which is very easy. And you have uh, the whole basis even just by powers of e and f. But if you would like to, to work in the integral form of the UQSL2, then you have to work to switch to the canonical basis. And this is what, what was the uh, subject of the previous talk. And I just wanted uh, uh, that you uh, look at the case where B is equal to A. Then what I wanted to point it out is that uh, in the case when N is negative and B is equal to A, then EAFA is a canonical basis, uh, basis in the case when N is negative and FE is a canonical basis, basis in the case when N is positive. And this fact uh, can be so easily uh, shown, for example, in this example. So if you just take the case of f times e, and you apply it on some weight space 1n, on some idempotent 1n, then you see that uh, in the case uh, when n is positive, then e f minus f e is given by this formula. And in the case when n is negative, then uh, it's given by the same formula where you have everywhere minuses. So this means that, that I can write down, in the, in, the, in the first case, I can write down EF as a linear combination of FE and all these powers of Q with all these positive coefficients. And in the other case, I can write FE as a sum of EF with all this, again, with all positive coefficients. So this, this, uh, this is an illustration of the fact that depending on the, uh, on the sign of this, of this region and in my pictures later, so either EF or FE will play the role of the, of the, of the canonical basis. So they switch depending on the sign of, of N. Okay, so um, this uh, U dot, so this quantum method 2 together with a set of projections, this one end, uh, has a natural structure of a category. Uh, by taking n objects, uh, this set has morphisms, and the composition is just taking, the composition just taking side by side multiplication of or E and F. And it's zero if these indices do, do not match. So it's just a non so natural structure of the category. And what uh, Aaron uh, did in the case of SL2 and uh, together with uh, Michael Kubanov, they did for SLN, is that they extended the structure to the structure of two categories. And so two category just means that uh, you look just as, you forget about object, you look at the morphism, and this morphism form again a category. So you have a set of morphism between morphisms, yes, which are called two morphisms. So this is what they did, so they really construct a whole set of two morphism relations between them. And, uh, um, and this is probably the first result in this direction. So geometric verification was done perhaps before by Lustig and the other people, but it was only done for U pluses, as I know, and the whole structure for the whole U 
I think this was the first place to look at all the categorification. Okay, and uh, I just recall you that you have very few morphisms. So it's again given by this dots, the crossings, and caps and cups. So really very small set. And you can uh, explicitly write down the degree of each such morphism. And uh, we have the only thing which uh, Aaron didn't tell today in the talk, and I can perhaps uh, uh, explain. Uh, this is where, where these two morphisms, in fact, are coming from. And they uh, are coming, so just suppose we suspect that our one category has a richer structure, that you have uh, also two morphisms going between such states. Then uh, to any two given pair of uh, one morphism, for instance, E and E, you can associate a graded vector space uh, of the forms between E and E. Okay, and if you de decategorify, this will give you a trace. So you will see this, this richer structure on the, on the, just on the level of this, of this one category by looking at the, uh, at the pairing between this E and E. So if you have a pairing where uh, the coefficients are always natural, then you can inter interpret this coefficient as a great dimensions of the space of two morphisms. And this pairing, so it's exactly lustic pairing, will give you, so to say, the, the, the space of two morphism uh, uh, in the structure, uh, before, uh, in the upper structure, so what, over, over this set of one morphism. This is what, what was done by, uh, by Aaron. So, uh, for instance, in the case of E and E, this pairing, which I was talking about, so we're just uh, looking at some pairing which has this, natural, uh, this nice property where all coefficients are natural. So, uh, in this case, uh, E and E, the elastic pairing is given by this formula, and this means just that you have, uh, uh, so if you introduce one, two morphism of degree two, given by dot, then this will categorify this, uh, this pairing, in the sense that you have a one-dimensional space of morphism in degree zero from E to E, just a line, then you have dimension one space in degree two, which is given line with a dot. Then you have, uh, again, one dimensional space of morphism from E to E in degree four, which is given by two dots, and so on. Okay, so this is just the motivation for this, uh, for the introducing a dot. And then if you look at, uh, at the, for example, at the pairing between E and E square, E square, E square, then given by this formula, and clearly, so here, this part is very easy, so this is just putting a dot on each strand. So all possible ways of putting a dot on one of this, of this four strand, or, or sorry, of this, uh, of this two strands give you, give you exactly this formula. And the only new phenomenon appears because of, of, of this coefficient. So this, uh, this coefficient in front of, of this one says you that you need somebody in degree minus two. You don't, you, you don't have uh, a morphism, two morphisms in degree minus two, so you have to introduce one. And this is exactly uh, this guy in degree minus two. And clearly, because you you don't have um, you don't have anybody in degree minus four, so you have to input the relation that if you if you do this crossing twice, then it should be zero. Otherwise, you you will you will you have C in this um, in this pairing somebody in degree minus four, and it doesn't appear. So this this gives you the first the first new Hecker relation. Okay, and uh, the next thing, uh, so if you look at this formula, for instance, if you ask, so what is the dimension of the space uh, of two morphism between E square and E square in degree zero? So you can easily compute this from this formula, so you can multiply this one from one in the in expansion of, of one term in this product into such things and another one, so you, you will, so, uh, okay, so I think everybody can do this and you will see that the dimension of the space of two morphism between these two guys in degree zero is exactly three. But if you look at the, at the all possible morphism you have already in degree zero, then we will have five guys. Yeah, so this is somebody, so if you put a, uh, Oh, this should be another strand, so you don't see here. So here you have two strands. So this is uh, identity morphism from E square to E square. This is one, uh, 
one morphism in degree, in degree zero, then you have this morphism in degree zero, which states that uh, so this uh, this crossing is degree minus two and dot degree plus two, so it's degree zero morphism. And then you have all other possibilities to put dot on these two strands, so you have five possibilities. And because the space is three-dimensional, you have to impose two relations. And these two relations are just this famous Nihaker relations. Okay, so this is how it works, how you, how, how you categorify your uh, one category. If you have a nice uh, uh, pairing, with, net, with natural coefficients. And then you impose all this, uh, so because you, you you know that the space of uh, degree zero morphism from E to E, given by this line, just one dimensional, then you have to impose that this guy, so after, okay, so you compute the degree of this element, again by taking a uh, uh, pairing between EF and 1F and these between 1n and ex, so you can compute all of them, and uh, finally you have to, 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 to expose all this relation. And finally, uh, so I will use this notation for the, for the bubbles, so again, so in the cases where, uh, where the whole number here is positive, then it's uh, just a normal bubble with dot, but if it's uh, the whole number here is negative, then it's so-called tape bubble, and again, they are subject to this infinite plus minor relation. So it's exactly like it's a... So I, I want to make sure that I understand clearly. Uh, one morphism is uh, still a picture from right to left uh, with uh, strands, uh, uh, but uh, oh. two pictures is two dimensions. One, one morphism is one... So, so, so the picture, the, the two-dimensional picture, uh, it's, it's always yeah. This this is this so what is, is, is the difference between two morphisms and one morphism here. So one morphism here is just what is sitting on the on the boundary uh -huh. here. Okay. So so this is this is a two morphism from one n to one n. Okay. okay. So and uh, so for instance in this picture yeah here. So this is uh, uh, this is uh, a two morphism from. E, so if you have, so you're just looking at the boundary here, if you look at the boundary is the up arrow, then it goes from E and it's uh, to E, okay? And uh, so this guy, for instance, is go, goes from F times F, so F squared to, to F So, so boundary, boundary are one morphism and pictures are two morphisms. So that's and one I, and no, no, it's two morphism. It's two morphism, and uh, uh, the region just uh, so. Um, so we have a very natural explanation for this. Uh, so this I learned from Aaron. This is perhaps you will like it. So normally, if you If you're speaking about one category, then you represent an uh, object by dots and uh, one morphism by it. So, for instance, if this is n and this is m, then this would be one morphism from n to n, and you can compose like this. Okay? And then if you have a two morphism, g, uh, from, uh, between the same object, and here you, you have the space for your. So, yeah? And now you apply uh, Poincare reality to this. Okay? And so your points will be regions, okay? So this will be F, this will be one morphism by F, this will be your dot, so region will be dot by Poincare duality, this will be your alpha, and this will be G. Okay, so, so, so this is... I think I screwed people up because I was drawing the identity to two morphisms saying that was the one morphism. I think that might be right. Okay. Okay, so, so now I'm coming slowly to the subject of my talk. So I was interested exactly in the center of this, uh, of this uh, so first of all, the center of the UQSL2. So this, the center of the quantum group SL2 is generated just by this Casimir operator. And you can write this either in this way, using EF, or in this way, using FE. So perhaps you have seen the expression for this Casimir where uh, you, you, you just divided everything by, 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 this, by this polynomial. Yeah, this is a 
here, so it's used when you're working not with, uh, with the integral version of the algebra, but in the integral world, you have to multiply everything by this. And uh, this element uh, is used to take apart the different representation for example. So it's, it's a very useful element. Okay, uh, so you can pass from this expression to this one just by using a commutator between a f and e. So it's now if you apply uh, this element to 1n, then k will disappear. So I, I just use the relation the k act on 1n by the power of q, which is qn. So you will have this expression or that expression for the acting. And clearly, so, uh, so Michael was visiting me like uh, in March 2009. And so we were looking at this element and it took him uh, okay, sorry. So it took him exactly two minutes to write this complex. So, and, um, so uh, for, for those who are not so quick, I will explain. So, so you, you would like to write a complex. So, so first of all, why it should be complex? So it should be complex because of this minus two. So you, you see an expression which is not all, everything with a positive coefficient. Otherwise, we just can draw this as a diagram. Uh, just the linear combination of the whole pictures. But now, so we have this minus 2. This means that uh, two copies of this Fe should, be, should stay in the other homological, so in the odd homological degree, uh, compared so compare to all other elements, it should be in the, in the even homological degree. Yeah, this is exactly what I did. So I put here in the zero homological degree, I put two copies of Fe without any gradient shifts. Yeah, because it's just because. So they represent this, this contribution of these two. Okay, then I put uh, one copy of Fe in degree two, and I put one copy of degree Fe in degree minus two. Okay, and then uh, these guys are just one n in degree one plus n here, and somebody here in degree minus n minus, minus one. And uh, then what you see is just, uh, so you would like, to, to have a complex where the differential has degree zero, because you would like that your homology is preserved, so it's, it's a graded invariant. Yes, this is uh, how, how the things normally works. So you would like the degree of this guy, of this, of this uh, differential, be zero, and the degree of this differential is exactly degree of, of the target minus degree of the source plus degree of the map. So what we have here is minus two plus minus zero. Okay, so, and now, uh, so, to, to find a differential here, you just put a uh, dot on the other slot, and uh, to go from here to here, you again, you put a dot on, uh, so on the complementary position, uh, so in such a way that the whole this square is commutative. And the distribution of sign is completely arbitrary, so we just choose it in this way. Okay, and now uh, for this one end, so clearly the, the, the most natural map uh, from just from one end to the Fe is just given by this half. Yeah, and this here, and it's just turned out to have completely, completely right degree. So, uh, so it has degree minus, minus n minus 1, and uh, sorry, it has degree n plus 1, and you have to subtract the degree of this guy, and then you have exactly the map of degree 0. And uh, again, so to go here, you, you, you put this guy, you put this guy, and again you have this square commutative. And also, so the third square, where you go like this, like this, like this, like this, it's all, also easily seen to be commutative. I don't understand, I mean, why you put it in the homological degree, that doesn't seem for us, nor the differential, I mean, those have the correct degree, I could have just put zero everywhere. Yeah, so I mean, you can switch the whole complex in whatever degree you want. So. But I'm saying I could have also taken, you know, as long as I preserve the parity, I can take the, yeah, the zero, doesn't the zero differential also give you the right answer for the other characteristics? Yeah, yeah. Um, then, I, then I had the liberty also to change the homological degree just preserving the parity. Uh, uh, so just to put everybody at zero, it's kind of... Well, I agree, maybe it's not... I, but I don't understand somehow. It doesn't seem like it. So it seems like this place is the huh? You want to proceed with everything. I don't know, but I, I mean, this is, this is just there. So it will definitely not give you anything, anything new if you just care. Oh, okay. 
I mean, uh, I don't know, so at least uh, we want it to have an option. Well, I mean, part, yeah, that's the, the zero, the, putting zero there is more what I would have written down from this, but I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the I mean, oh, you can always uh, write, yeah, for anything could be by just the risk there. Yeah, but uh, the part of the question is also why, I mean, to what extent are, you know, you have a lot of degree zero morphisms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, clearly, 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 clearly. Clear, clear. So I will, uh, yeah, I, uh, probably you will, you will, so, uh, so we just, so I mean, it was not our great contribution to the, to the science that we just uh, wrote this complex here. So we just, uh, we, we also show some properties of the complex, you will see in the minutes, and you will, and you will see that it's, uh, the, the, it seems to be really absolutely rigid, the structure, that you can, clearly, you can, you can uh, add, uh, add a bubble somewhere. Everywhere, so, so clearly. So it's absolutely uh, uh, so. I as it stays here, it's absolutely non-unique. Yeah. It just uh, the, the most simple, the stupid complex you can write down. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps the, the, the better one is to put just everywhere zeros. Yeah. But uh, if you forget about this one, the, the next, the most simplest way to write it down. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so and the, uh, the statement will be uh, it's actually a box. So you, it has really great properties. Okay. Okay, so um, this is um, this is an alternative complex in the case where you switch f and e. So again, uh, so the main idea is the same. You can put uh, two guys in degree zero, one in degree plus two minus two. You have again the same square for the for the dots. And here you just change the orientation. So see, of course, the whole degree will be a little bit switched, but it's exactly correspond to the to the second expression for the for this of Casimir element in terms of um, E and F. And so, um, uh, so I'm taking care about these two complexes because, uh, as you learn in uh, Aaron's talk, so this basis is canonical exactly in the case when N is positive, and this basis is canonical exactly in the case when N is negative, and will, it will be important in the, in the future. So this is a great theorem. Yeah, this is you just... Uh, so I will I will show perhaps the whole theory. So this uh, so we were working like a year on proving on proving these properties. So the first okay the first statement is just saying that uh, uh, both these complexes are homotopy equivalent to each other. So either you can verify the first expression or the second expression as in the way I showed you that they are they are homotopy equivalent. This is a more interesting uh, property. So this. Um, this is a categorification of the fact that Casimir is in the center, that uh, E times the Casimir is the same as uh, Casimir times E. So it's really commute with any generator. So here you consider the category of complexes over the two categories. So in this case, so I'm just forgetting about objects and I'm just considering as a category uh, just one morphism and two morphisms. This gives you a category and that over this category I consider the category of complexes. Okay, and I take any complex in this category, and I just tensor this, uh, so on the left with C, and this turns out to be homotopy equivalent to, to, to tensoring this complex on the right. So I'm not writing this tensor sign here just because, in my case, the monoidal structure is just putting a bunch of strands on the left or on the right of, of, my, of my generator. So therefore, it's just, uh, so it's just a notation. But this is exactly a categorification of the, of the, of the properties that my uh, C is really in the set, so in, in the center of the two categories. And the second interesting properties of this complex is that it's commute with, the, uh, uh, with two morphisms, so with any chain map. So what does it mean? So, uh, this, uh, so we, we write down in the proof, we write down the explicit two morphism, uh, sorry, the explicit chain map, between, uh, between this left hand side and right hand side. So let us denote this chain map just by kappa x and the, or, and the inverse of this map by kappa bar x. Okay, then if you, if you apply this chain map from, from this complex to this complex and, or, uh, so, and then apply some two morphism, uh, some chain map from x to y, then this turns out to be the same up to homotopy as first uh, apply your chain map and then this commutation uh, morphism. And the same, the same happens to be true for the, for the inverse map. So this is really, so I think it's the first result about the center of these two categories. 
and uh, so and this probably uh, this probably is really heavily non-trivial. So I can show so how we uh, start. So clearly, so we were not interested to show insects like this. this in the beginning. We just wanted to show. Um, so, uh, so we wanted to show, in fact, uh, exactly this property. This was our starting point. And uh, to show this, it's enough to look just at the generators in your category, just on E and F. So it's sufficient to say that if you multiply on the left, say, F times the Casimir, then uh, you're able to find a chain homotopy to the complex where you multiply this F on the right. So this was uh, our starting point when R came to Zurich. And uh, so, my, uh, so in my office in Zurich, I have a blackboard which is looking like, like a book. And so this, is, this was, uh, so after, after a week of work, this, uh, one, one side of this blackboard was looking like this, and the other was looking like this. <laughs> and uh, so it was three pages, and they were completely covered by these pictures. And I should say that for the moment, so our faculty sell this picture very effectively to the, to the, to the, uh, to the coming students. So it's uh, just regarded by most of the people just as modern art, and uh, looked uh, so, uh, really, uh, so they, they're coming to us. Uh, by, uh, so because they, they found this just great. Okay, so uh, perhaps we should not look at this as a modern art, but just you know, try to understand what happens. And uh, so on the top of this, of this picture, what you see is the complex for Fe multiplied on the left by F. So you see exactly the differential which you have seen before, with the only difference that there is uh, one additional line on the far left, which is pointing down, which is just stay for the identity on the F. So this is this is our complex. So it's it's a complex for F times the Casimir. And on the bottom you have the complex for the Casimir times F. Okay? And uh, so you see here the answer is the answer is really not so complicated. Yeah, you see so the whole chain 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 marks are just drawn there. But so when we started this we just uh, were we were hoping that the God is kind for us and that just all, all, all these chain maps can be drawn without any bubbles. Yeah? And so we just, so we, our starting point, we just write down the linear combination, the most general, of all morphism in the correct degree. Uh, there are not so many, so it was like six terms, or perhaps eight terms, some, sometimes. So just, and we were uh, checking the conditions that this is exactly a chain map. So you just go from here, yeah, and we have much more maps at the beginning, yeah, they were not zero, and so on. And so after you check this expression just uh, on the position one to three, yeah, then all coefficients will be either zero or one, so very, very, very quickly. And then you're just hoping that, uh, that if you check on the other position, it should, it should be true again, yeah. And in fact, it was really true, so, uh, so it took us a week to, to, to find out this uh, this, this nice chain map, and that we were very glad to, to have them in this way and uh, without bubbles. So, so this was kind of magic. That this, you, you can write them down. Okay, and uh, so here it's a proof. So it was really just one blackboard proof why it's a chain map. So should I go into details? How many times? <laughs> <laughs> uh. So you have about 20 more minutes. Okay. Okay, let us, uh, so let us just uh, check the positions, say, uh, or say, two, this is two prime to three. Okay, we would like just to, uh, to be sure this is exactly a chain map. So what you are doing, so there is just one map from two, two prime to one, which is given by Z. And then you have to compose this with a differential, which will add a dot on the middle, on the, so on the up, so on the, uh, here, it will put the dot there, okay? And then you have to see that this is exactly the same as to go here, so you have no map here, so you have to go there, and with this map down. So you have to go with uh, this guy, so you have to add this guy on the bottom of this map. So just connect this like this. Connect here like this. Okay, and this is what, what is proven here. I think this is one to three. One prime, uh, two prime to three. And this is exactly the equality which can be checked by using the, uh, the relation error drawn. So, so basically a relation you use is this relation. Yeah, and uh, the point is that uh, these two 
terms cancel. Because they're exactly the same, they're exactly the same for this guy and that guy, so they say after cancel, and this is very nice. So, okay, so we were, so as I said before, we have no freedom in, in this chain map, so we just, they were very rigid, we just put, so they, they are just like they are, and we are just hoping that there exists some homotopy, yeah? And we had uh, uh, very quickly guess what the homotopy should be, so we write this is written here in red, yeah, and uh, okay, so you just, uh, so we were just hoping uh, it's, it should be true, and um, so this, uh, from, from here, it's a computation for the homotopy, and it was exactly true for all position uh, for this uh, upper complex, and then we started, so we were, we were, so this was after the lunch, and we were completely sure that it has to, to work exactly the same way for the, for the down complex, so it uh, should be no problem. Okay, and, uh, and here was a big surprise that it was not working. So what <laughs> So it was just not working, and um, uh, the point is it was working, but only for special values of N. And only for those, in fact, so what we realized, it was, so this complex, so this Fe complex, it's a, um, so Fe, it's a canonical basis in the case where N is positive, and not in the case, so in the case where N is negative, then it's much more complicated, it's not indecomposable anymore. You have to decompose it with a lot of bubbles. So you probably cannot expect it, that the whole story is so nice without any bubbles in the case when this guy is, uh, is uh, decomposable. And uh, so this is exactly how it was, so how it happened. So it was working, so such crazy relation, where exactly they were working for some special for N uh, positive and they were not working for N negative. What's the what what so this is a homotopy. You see, this is the map. So this is red. Uh, if you, um, no, I mean, I mean, what you, what you would like to see is that if you, if you compose this blue map oh, sorry, together with this one, sorry, it's, sorry. it's homotopic to identity. Ah, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, so okay, okay. So there are blue and there are green. Okay, if you compose them both, then uh, it should be home to be identity. This is, and it was true on the, on the upper level, it was not true so on the bottom. Okay, okay and uh, so, okay, but uh, then, so we were very sad for one day, but then we decided that this life is not so bad, that so perhaps uh, what you can do, you can, uh, for, for negative n, you can just uh, use another complex, this C prime, Oh, sorry, sorry, for C prime, so we, we saw so that, that we, can, uh, we can use the other complex C and we can show, so just by applying one of these symmetry factors, so you know you have, so uh, you, SO2 has a lot of symmetries, so all this, uh, so switching or orientation of arrows, for instance, one of the symmetries is switching to the orientation of all arrows and uh, exchange N by minus N. And basically already that, and we have some reflection, Will give you uh, will give you the proof in the case of the other of the other complex multiplied by f for negative n. So because you have to switch n to minus n. And um, then we decided so okay so if it works like this and let us just show that uh, these complexes are homotopy equivalent for all n and we, then we are done with, with our property. And so we have to start, so we, uh, again, so we started to calculate it and we constructed these maps, chain maps going up and down. So they are like this, this is basically just a combination of vowels and caps. Okay, and we will also be able to, to write down what are the commodities. So the commodities are just also given by some combination and they are, they are all, uh, so for instance, all uh, the commodities, these commodities are non-zero if n is positive and this these guys are non-zero if n is negative, and so on. So it's, uh, it's uh, so they are very sensible. What I wanted to say, they are very sensible to the value to the exact value of n. Okay. So and finally, so we were, we uh, we shown we, we have shown this lemma. So it's uh, for positive n, uh, any generator, so whether you take f or e, it's commute with multiply. With, so these two complexes are just homotopy equivalent, and. Uh, so what I should say about this, uh, the whole, this two, the first two items, it just, in fact, you just need to, to do only one computation. And then by applying symmetries, you get this, this, and that. Yeah. So you have a full group of Z2 times 3, 
of symmetries and by applying this you can just uh, get the rest. And we also sh have shown this property that C and C prime are homotopy equivalent for all n. And so we consider it as mostly as the uh, end of the story. So it looked like Aaron was happy. And uh, so I was also happy. No, sorry. So I was also happy first. So it, uh, and so being so happy, so he just left to, to, to Colombia. But uh, this is, was not the end of the story because somebody was not happy. So Michael asked us, so what in fact happens uh, if n is equal to 1? So what is exactly so in this case if n is equal to 1 is the only case where if you apply f to this guy, then you switch between positive and negative values of n. Yeah. And for this, so we, we didn't have really a chain map. So, so okay, so we, we could just sit down and just uh, do this case uh, separately. But uh, in order to be able really to, to work with these complexes, you would like to have something, something uh, so intrinsically defined for all values of n. So we decided that a good idea would be to construct a really a map, uh, so switching E from left to right for all values of n. And uh, so the idea was the following one. So if you look uh, at the map we already constructed from Fc to Cf, so it was a perfectly defined map in the case for negative n. And here between C prime and F it was a perfectly defined map for for positive n. So now to construct this map for positive n, what we decided to do is just to compose this chain map with this both chain equivalent. So all, all, also this uh, chain maps going from C to C prime and from C prime to C. So they were already constructed uh, before by showing the uh, uh, equivalence, homotopy equivalence of C and C prime. And the same we did also for the, for the inverse. And this was kind of uh, tough computation. So this was again, uh, uh, so Aaron was working very, very hard. And at the end, so he arrived to this great map. So, uh, if, you <laughs> so if you look uh, at this bouquet of bullets, and you, perhaps you can recognize the map uh, you have seen on my board, so if you just restrict to the case n is negative, then all these bubble terms disappear. Uh, so this kind of step function, as we discover also this in, in February, this is also kind of a step function. It's just zero for negative n and one, or just a cap for positive n. So all, all the strange things disappear if you are working in the indecomposable case. And if you are in the decomposable case, uh, the world becomes more complicated and all these bubbles should be taken into account. Okay, so uh, this was, uh, and finally again by applying symmetry you can, you can construct the inverse of this map and all the other maps you need for, for, for the other cases. Okay, and so my great contribution was to show the naturality for two morphisms. So what, what does it mean? So this means exactly if you look at our theorem, so the theorem I wanted to show. So it, it was this part of the theorem. So I just, uh, so assume we have this, this great maps for working for all n, then I wanted to show that they are really natural with respect to any chain map going from x to y. And again, to show this property, you have uh, to check it on the, on just on the generating to morphism. You have only three of them. So you have a dot, crossing, and caps, and cups. Okay, so, uh, so this... Uh, Somewhere across 
crossing and then uh, compare this to the, to, the, to, the, to the other way of putting this crossing on the top of this uh, of the square of this line. So um, this I was uh, I was able to, to do this in the indecomposable case where you just can uh, simplify gamma and in the decomposable so I uh, so so I was just thinking but should, should I spend another month of doing that? <laughs> okay, and the 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 solution was uh, the following one. So uh, perhaps I should also consider the, the case of cap. So here, you, again, you have to take two, comp uh, so compose two difficult chain maps, and once put uh, at the end of this map a cap, or just uh, compare this to just putting a cap. Okay. And so to, to prove such uh, such properties, yeah, what we decided to do is uh, to split the proof on two cases. So in, in the indecomposable case, we were just able just uh, explicitly to show that uh, this diagram commutes. And in the indecomposable case, we replace this diagram by a more complicated one. So where, for instance, if you would like to show that this commute for positive n, yeah, then uh, we reduce this to, the, to this commutative square in the case of negative n, where it's an indecomposable case. And uh, here you have all this homotopy equivalence going up and down. And so that all these uh, rectangles commute just by the previous result, and then from the commutativity in the indecomposable case, you can you can uh, decide about the commutativity of the whole diagram. So this is how it was uh, solved at the end. And uh, look how happy we were all three of us. And uh, I would like to stop here.
Okay, and then, so we'll continue after the lunch at 1.15.